Hello and welcome to a new episode of Curious. A new year means fresh ideas and new discoveries. And what better way than to kick things off by diving into a technology that's poised to lead more breakthroughs this year. Yes, we'll be talking about a simplified digital PCR adventure, the KaiQD way, in this episode of Curious. I'm here in the lab with Sebastian. Hi, Sebastian. Hi, Kochi. Thanks for having me today. Thanks for being here with us. Just a quick note for our audience. Please feel free to send in your questions during the show in the chat box that appears on the right side of your screen. Our experts will make sure to answer them during the show or right after. So, Sebastian, can you maybe tell us what digital PCR really is? What the principle is? How does it work? Absolutely. So dPCR is a very reliable method to quantify specific DNA or RNA templates. For example, to detect and quantify um, certain mutations or determine the copy number of certain genes. The basic principle of dPCR is the separation of the whole PCR reaction into thousands of individual compartments, or we call it partitions. Then the amplification of those partitions and afterwards the detection of those partitions where the amplification took place. And that's done by measuring fluorescent light of dyes that are bound to the uh, amplicons. I mean, that sounds quite complex, but all of this is integrated into the KaiQT instrument and fully automated. Oh, wow. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but. Um is there anywhere people can find more information about this if people want to just delve more into details of the principle or the mechanism, how this works? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, you can check out our website or the resources that are linked in the QR code that you can see on the screen now. Okay, perfect. Well, so you, you talked about the instrument. So can you maybe explain to us how easy it is to set up a DPCR run, for example? Yeah. So it all starts here with the KaiQT software suite. So the first step here is to create a new plate and by that a new experiment. So in the beginning you de define which plate type you want to use and then put in all the PCR um, parameters like the cycling profile or temperature gradient. You put in all the sample or reaction mix details, choose um, one or multiple assays and arrange that all on the plate. And after that um, you simply um, save it and uh, all data of the experiment is automatically sent to the instrument. The nice thing about that is that can be done in the office, so no need to do that in the, in the lab, and that's great for flexibility. Right, that's pretty convenient, right? Um, so, but, but that happens, imagine, in the office space where you kind of set up your run, everything is ready. Uh, what happens with the physical place that I see here? What do you do in the lab then? Yeah, so um, in the lab then, um, there's a, it starts with the preparation of the physical place. So the um, master mix and um, th samples are pipetted into those uh, nanoplates and that's um, very comparable to uh, qPCR, to the qPCR workflow. And for that we offer different plate types. So um, we have 8-well, uh, 24-well uh, um, and 96-well formats and also different number of partitions. And um, yeah, customers could choose based on their need on uh, throughput or sensitivity, what plate to use. And for the highest sensitivity, we would recommend our 1024 HV well plate, which has um, 26,000 petitions per well. Great. So you set up the plate and then you can, I'm assuming, seal the plate. And, and what's next? What happens next? That's right. So um, once everything is set up, plate is ready. It's simply putting in the plate into the instrument. And um, you either knew the barcode of the plate before and put it into the experimental setup, but if you haven't done that so far, it's also possible to start the run on the instrument by um, basically get, choosing in a drop-down menu of all experiments that are already set up. So that's quite convenient. Cool. And then it's simply uh, choosing the plate and pressing play. So quite easy. Awesome. And then you just walk away from the lab, I imagine. So you, you come back, how long is this workflow? How long does this take really? It depends a little bit on the parameter that you choose. So especially number of channels and the cycling profile, but um, we say up to uh, two hours, uh, the first plate is ready. 
Oh. Or even, even less. Well, well, that's pretty similar to a QPCR like workflow, as you mentioned then earlier. That's true. Right. Okay. So now that I, you know, you have the data, you're starting to analyze, but maybe let me ask you one, one question before that. So the, the plate goes in, now nobody sees what's happening inside the instrument. I'm sure our audience will appreciate if you could explain what is exactly happening inside the instrument, because I'm saying the magic is, is all there. Yeah, sure. So uh, basically the instrument has three functional key modules. The first module in the workflow is the partitioning module. In there, the uh, liquid is pushed through the microstructures that all thousands of partitions are filled. Next step in the same module is the closing of the micro channels that are connecting those partitions. And by that, up to 26,000 individual compartments, partitions are generated. The next uh, module in the workflow is the thermocycler module. So that's a Peltier-based thermocycler and that applies the um, temperature cycling profile that you predefined or a temperature gradient. And the um, last module in the uh, workflow step is the uh, imaging module. So in there, the detection uh, takes place. So that's a uh, camera-based fluorescence um, module that basically takes um, yeah, several images per well, depending on the channels that you have chosen. One fun fact about that imaging module. Oh, the uh, fun fact, I'm curious. Did you know that the uh, KQT Instruments and the Mars Rover Curiosity has something in common? No, I don't, and in I'm fact, more curious now. In fact, they both share the same um, autofocus algorithm. That's um, let's say an algorithm that's based on JPEG compression mm -hmm. and do, to determine the best uh, focus position, so to get sharp images. Oh, wow, impressive. Uh, so it's cool to see this, but so this is this is really a very automated system from start to finish, as I imagine. Is that so? That's right. So it's fully automated. So once you press play, you can go into the office and wait until the run is ready. So all data is um, directly sent to the instrument. The post processing is started automatically, and in your office you can start the analysis. And if you're interested in more automation, it would be even possible to automate that first um, preparation step. So the um, sample preparation and pipetting right. by using a liquid handler, for example, our Cardiality system. Oh, so that makes it even more convenient for customers yeah. than to handle, you know, many more samples, right? Yeah. Well, great. So I, I think talking about, um, you know, the, the cycling parameters you mentioned, I, I read somewhere that we have four different types of instruments or three different configurations, as we know. Um, a one plate, a four plate, and an eight plate. Just curious, can people load all the plates at the same time and set up different cycling parameters? Or do they have to end up in you know, one common cycling parameter? Yeah, so the four plate and the eight plate instruments, uh, they um, enable or offer a continuous loading. Oh. So whenever there is a free available plate slot, it's possible to load a new plate, start it, or it's even possible to change the order, the priority of plates if that's needed. And the second question was about the parameters, right? Right, the, the cycling parameters. Yeah, so the um, parameters, um, cycling and imaging parameters, are defined per experiment, so per plate. Meaning, for sure, each and every plate can have um, separate cycling um, um, par uh, profiles. Or if you're interested in a range of temperature, you choose a gra temperature gradient for a plate. And uh, correct, so it's quite flexible there. Indeed, it's, it sounds really flexible to work with this instrument then. Well, now we come to something more exciting. Um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you run it, people are always curious and then wait and eagerly wait for the results that come out of this instrument, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a software here. So what does it really do and how, how people can analyze the data? Yeah, let's dive into it. So um, what, what we see here is our uh, life science research use only suite running on uh, version of 3.1. And let's just dive into an example run and uh, look how an analysis uh, looks like. So you um, choose a plate from the plate overview and hit the analyze button. The next step is then to choose the wells you want to take a look at and you define if you want to analyze per target or per channel. So in that case, let's go for a uh, channel based analysis. Um, let's choose all available, available eight channels here. So that's an eight plex run and you simply hit show results. All right, so, so I gather you, you have identified the targets you've, or the channels, as you say. Uh, so what's next? How do you visualize the data, really? Uh, so most of the time interesting is um, the differentiation between negative and positive targets. Mm -hmm. So you would most likely start with the uh, 1D scatter plot to see how good the differentiation is in there. 
So that we see here now, so um, the software sets automatic thresholds, but it would be possible to adjust that here, so with a global threshold, for example. It's a multiplex assay, like here. It's most of the time more interesting to look at two channels in parallel and um, basically to plot it in two dimensions. So let's do it like that. Um, we have the uh, green channel on the x-axis, the yellow on the y-axis. And here you see now all data plotted and as well it would be possible to change a threshold here. Right. So as I see this, so here I can imagine all the, the 2D scatter plots. So you basically summarize the data and see it in one 2D scatter plot. Yep. Is there any way to kind of separate those into individual plots just for better overview? Uh, yeah, in fact, there is. So um, with the software update 3.0, we implemented a new feature that can be found down below here in the custom analysis. So if you hit that plus button, you need to choose first if you want to um, show all selected worlds. So if we start with that, so you see then all individual worlds in the same layout, so the same 2D scatter plot. In there, it would be possible to um, jump, zoom into a specific well. And again, so you can either um, change the threshold by the crosshair here and um, or what's also possible, um, we have a so-called uh, lasso function. So it's like a polygon, um, polygon selection that you could use to, to define the area for the threshold. Great. What's nice about that is that's happening basically in live view. So whenever oh, wow. you um, change something here with the thresholds, it's automatically recalculated in the background. Mm -hmm. So that's also new compared to before. The other possibility in there is to analyze um, per samples. And that's also a quite nice view. If you select the uh, samples available, you see then um, that the data is separated by sample. So um, in, on the left-hand side here, you see the combined data of all wells that are um, connected to sample mm -hmm. one. And on the right-hand side, the um, rep replicates, so all single well data. And as well, it's possible to um, change thresholds either globally in that one or in the individual wells. Okay. Um, so so this, this seems like people can extract the data as they like. This is, you know, on the go. So this is really nice. Uh, this is, however, a visual distribution mm -hmm. of the signals, basically. Um, is there any way to see like a results table, a bit more digestible format, uh, like a results table, if you could show us something? Yeah, sure. So we, for that, we have the uh, list overview in here. And there you find all quantitative information. So from the concentration values of a partitions count. Maybe, you know, it's, it all sounds fantastic. I, I remember you talked about the multiplex assays earlier, uh, right? I mean, I, I also kind of going back, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in from the audience about multiplexing. I'm sure that's a hot topic. Uh, I'm, I'm also assuming our experts are busy answering some of those questions right in the chat. Uh, but uh, do you kind of want to give a sneak peek of what's coming up with this new software release? What are the multiplexing capabilities that we have now? Yeah, sure. So with the um, software version 3.0, we introduced three additional channels. So um, with that software, it's possible to run seven and eight plex runs. And that's um, basically achieved by varying the filter combination uh, compared to our six standard um, channels. Mm -hmm. And that's um, possible by using so-called long stoke shift dice. Um, what are long stoke shift dice? I'm, I'm curious what exactly they are, because this is a new concept for me. Yeah, sure. So the, the stoke shift is the shift between the absorbance and the emission spectrum of fluorescence dyes. And for those um, dyes, it's um, way longer compared to normal uh, fluorescence dyes. So it's in the range of 100 nanometers. And, and to detect them, to measure the signal, we simply um, switch filters differently. So um, I picked an 8 one you, so we can see that here. Um, for example, the seventh channel here, the excitation filter is the one from the standard green channel, but the emission filter is longer in wavelength, so it's the one from the yellow um, standard channel. And by simply combining the filters different, we get another channel. And the customers can choose um, out of five different channel combinations, uh, which depending on which dice they have. Right. So this brings in a lot of more advanced multiplexing capabilities, as you said. Uh, but imagine, you know, our, I'm sure in our audience we have um, users of the Kai QD1, for example, the fiveplex instrument. Yeah. Can they easily upgrade to this? Is there a hardware change or a software change that they're looking at? 
that's a very nice thing about that update because um, our car you do one five plates, the a four plate and the eight plate are basically from hardware perspective already capable of doing that. So the imaging module can switch filters independently, uh, excitation emission filter, meaning all this can, it can be achieved just by upgrading the um, control software and the suite software. And in addition, um, use our high multiplexing master mix. And that's all basically. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, um, interesting. Um, I, I, I'm just going to ask you to reveal something more. Uh, I hear that we are also able to now do amplitude multiplexing and kind of combine this with 12 plex assays. So is this software capable of supporting 12 plex assays? Is that true? It is indeed. So that was introduced um, with the latest software 3.1. Right. Let, let's pick up an example yeah, that'll be here. Great. So we have um, one example run of amplitude multiplexing, and that's uh, indeed a 12 plex run here. Um, let's go into the analysis again, select all wells, and look at the results. So in here, you might already see a difference. So the amplitude multiplexing is achieved by basically having two targets and basically in the end two amplicons at different brightness levels, but in one channel. Mm -hmm. So meaning, look at that example here in the green channel, we don't have just one target, but we have a mm -hmm. low target mm -hmm. and a high target that are different in brightness or so in RFU value. If we look at that, or if you look at the 1D scatter plot, that leads to the fact that we don't have uh, two bands, positive, negative, but in total four bands. So we have um, the low target positive band, the high target positive band, and also a double positive band, because there is a likelihood that right. um, high and low target in, are in the same partition. And um, as well, so there's an automatic thresholding um, happening, so to differentiate between the different bands, but it all can be fine-tuned here. It's amazing. It was also nice. Let's um, shortly look into that. So, oh, the signal um, map. Yeah, so that's quite interesting because um, with these all those different um, targets, or let's say um, um, brightness levels, what we introduced here is to see that with a color overview also on the signal map. So if we if you look at that, so the different colors now indicate if it's the low, the high target, or the double positive target. So it's a quite nice view, I think. I'm just amazed at looking at all these capabilities that the software really brings, and it's, it just makes the system more powerful. You know? yeah. uh, well, thanks, Sebastian, for this very informative demo. I'm sure our audience must have found it very helpful. Thanks for doing this. This is great to see an incredible system. I hope you also enjoyed this. Yeah, part. very much. Yeah, thanks for doing this for us. You're welcome. So, well, Digital PCR is a game-changing technology, and I think the KaiQuty Digital PCR system is just making it more accessible for researchers everywhere. If you are interested in learning more or seeing a live demonstration of it in your lab, then please scan the QR code that's flashing on your screen right now and request a personal consultation. Well, with that, we come to the end of this episode, but stay tuned for more exciting episodes of Curious this year. I'm a wedding, 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 I'm a